Good morning. Let's begin. Um, all right, so Thursday you've got a homework assignment due, and it's the beginning of a long break. Winter break is two weeks long, and sometimes there's a temptation to skip class before a long break because two weeks isn't enough, so you think, oh, it has to be 15 days or 16 days. I'd really discourage you from falling into that trap. We're going to cover some important material on Thursday, so I hope you'll make every effort to attend. And besides, the homework assignments do. So that's Thursday. Looking in the future to another Thursday, on the 7th, your project is due. And we spent some time talking about the project when we got together on Sunday. As you've been working on it, are there any further questions, any clarifications that you want to ask about? Yes. No. Uh, some some people are interested in like me pre-grading it and telling you if it's good. Um, I don't have time for that, unfortunately. If you have specific questions, you can stop by my office and we can discuss it. But uh, I don't have the capacity to tell you what your grade is, and then you can decide whether or not you want to fix it. That sort of a thing. Yeah. Although I can definitely see why you'd why you'd want something like that. All right. So what we're going to be talking about today is indirect cost rates and something called ABC allocation, activity-based costing. And these are different ways of accounting for indirect costs. Remember, indirect costs are those that are not easily attributable to a specific activity. And so if your business is trying to uh, to build homes, like to build houses, then it's easy to know the amount of wood required and how much tile. It's easy to know how much concrete, roofing materials, the quantity of labor. And so anything else that's not so easy to assign to the construction of one unit or whatever you're building, those are the indirect costs. And uh, these two methods are ways of assigning indirect costs. So we've just talked about how indirect costs are difficult to assign to a specific output. And so one of the uh, things that we sometimes do is try and figure out how to allocate. And so on the left are different categories of uh, items that can be considered indirect. Now on the left, these aren't always things that are indirect. Sometimes it is possible to assign them to a specific output or a specific activity. But in many cases, these are the sorts of things that, we, that would be in the indirect list. And so if you look, for example, taxes, heat, power, receiving. And so these are some of the support and infrastructure costs. So of these support and infrastructure costs, what this is saying is, um, let's say you have to pay taxes. So your company every year has to cover a certain amount of taxes, and the question is, how do you decide how much of the tax bill to put towards um, the thing that you're making? Well, if you have many different uh, activities in your company, let's say that you have one factory and you're making several different items. So one way to decide how much of the taxes should be covered by each of those different items that are being constructed is how much space is occupied in the building for the for the manufacturer of each item. So you're making three items. One of the items takes up a lot of floor space. Well, if it's property taxes that we're talking about, property taxes are often allocated on the size of the lot that's being occupied. And so then you just turn around and so do you pass through the costs to the things that are actually generating the revenue. Uh, if we take another one of these as an, an example, uh, software. And the university, you know, we spend so much money on software. The budget is really enormous, uh, the amount that we spend on software. Because not only is there operating systems like, um, you know, we're using Windows. Not only is there Office Suite so that you can have access to Word and Excel. But then there's a specialized design software as well, like eTabs, Vism for transportation. Um, we're using. Uh, water gems and water CAD for hydraulic design. You know, there's, there's a lot of specialized software that in some cases can be quite costly. And so what this is saying, it's not the only way of assigning the costs, but 
you know, with computers, you can actually keep track of who's using what software. And so if you're working in a company and there's different groups, you may have uh, offices all around the world and you're trying to decide uh, who is going to pay for the software, it doesn't necessarily just have to be every machine that it's installed on is, uh, is charged the same fee. But you could actually look at the, the amount of times that the software is being accessed. And so the number of times the program's booting up or some software actually keeps track of how long you're logged in using the, the software. And so what you want to do as a business relationship, the, the main idea is to try and allocate it in a way that is going to mirror the, uh, the usefulness of the, ca of the cost category. And so who, within the organization, who's getting the most benefit out of whatever the cost category is? In the case of power and electricity, um, you're not going to put a power meter on every single outlet and try and add up how much electricity each person used. And so there has to be some other way, if you look at the machines that are plugged in to your building's electrical system, you can find out which machines use a lot of electricity and which don't. And so uh, the idea is just to find some rational method for recovering the indirect costs. All right, so in the handout today, I've separated it into two papers. Does everyone have both papers? And the reason for that is you're going to turn in the one that has the line for your name. And in a minute, we're going to switch over to the ABC. And that's what the second page is. But I'm going to let you keep the AB, ABC method. Uh, not because it's complicated, but just in case you wanted to refer to it as you're working on the homework, then having them separate lets you take one with you while you turn in the other one for attendance purposes. All right. So let's start off with the indirect cost allocation. We've got a problem here where what we're doing is um, we have a construction company with three cost centers. Now, a cost center is something that is actually um, receiving the cost. Um, these are the activities that are ultimately generating revenue but there are also the activities that need a support structure. So the accounting department doesn't need to exist if there's no one it should be supporting. And there's no need for your building to have electricity unless someone inside the building is doing an activity that's ultimately going to generate revenue. So here when it says cost center, there's a technical definition behind that phrase that we'll get into a little bit more on the ABC method. So your company has these subdivisions, excavation company, an affiliate that uh, specializes in assembling, reinforcing steel, and then construction surveying. Now, what you can see is that there's not an even distribution in terms of how many employees is in each organization, their revenue. You know, there's a lot of difference between these companies. One of them is very technically specialized. That's the surveying division. You can see that they only have seven employees. Uh, the other one, the excavation company, they're getting a lot of revenue, but remember, revenue and profits aren't the same thing. It's likely that, they, that for an ex excavation company, they also have a lot of expenses as well, fuel and equipment costs and so on. So what we know down here below the table, it says that for the upcoming year, the organization has to assign $6.95 million in indirect costs. And so those are the, the expenses related to supporting the organization. And so what we're going to do is compare um, different ways that you could recover the costs. And um, each organization within the company, each subgroup, is going to have a different way of recovering it. Ultimately, they'll pass it along to their customers. And so the people who hire the excavation company, they're going to get a, a fraction of those indirect costs passed along to them. But in, in the problem statements here, A through D, I walk you through the idea of uh, how you should recover each of the costs for the three organizations. All right, so I'm going to turn you loose on that. You can, of course, as always, collaborate and uh, talk through this together. And I'll be circulating around with the solutions as you're working on it.
All right, let's take a look at some of these answers. I think people are starting to uh, figure it all out here. OK. So the, the argument here <coughs> is that the subdivision that's making the most revenue should cover more of the indirect costs. Now, probably the excavation company should say something like, well, we think that the indirect costs should be covered more by the steel group because they have more employees. You know, every subdivision is going to be trying to lower the amount of indirect costs they have to cover. But, so if we're just allocating on the base of their revenue, all we have to do is uh, find the total indirect costs that have to be recovered it and multiply that by the fraction of their revenue divided by the total revenue. So we can see that the excavation company is going to pay 5.38 million and so on. Yeah? My numbers for the survey group? He says it's right. I'm going to go with that. Maybe you round it off on the fraction or something? I don't know. 554? Five, five, Uh-oh. All right. No, next time I'll believe you. All right. So 554, five, 511? OK. Let me fix that right now. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is just Adobe Reader, so I don't have the typewriter on this one. All right. So for part B, there's this phrase here that's important. The indirect cost recovery surcharge. A surcharge is something you pass along to your customers to try and um, deal with some cost that you don't want to include in your base rates. So for example, I'll tell you about a surcharge I have to pay. Back in the United States, uh, I have to pay for garbage removal. It's not just covered by the municipality. So there's a company that comes and they take a garbage can from your driveway, put it in the truck and drive away. They charge $18 a month for that service of taking away the garbage once per week. And then on top of that, they want 54 cents as what they're calling a fuel, uh, a fuel surcharge. I guess because when the prices of diesel went up high in the United States, that was cutting into their revenue. And so they wanted to pass along to their customers the price of fuel. They didn't lower it once the price of diesel came down, but it's just a, a way. Of, and airlines are the worst for these sneaky little surcharges. If you look at the full receipt sometimes on an airline ticket, they're going to have so many surcharges. And they do it kind of to trick you, to make you think it's a tax that comes from the airport or a tax that comes from the government. And sometimes those line items are actually taxes from the government. But then oftentimes, it's an airline imposed surcharge that's just them trying to make the ticket look uh, less expensive than it really is. So here, the phrase indirect cost recovery surcharge, it means that they're going to be, each of these subdivisions is passing along to their customers the expenses, the administrative expenses and the support expenses that have to be paid to the main umbrella organization. So in the case of the uh, excavation company, for example, since they're doing 180,000 cubic meters of excavation, and we know that they have to pay the 5.3 million, then it works out to 29.92 uh, cubic uh, dollars per cubic meter. So on top of their base revenue, they probably already in their minds have some way of charging their customers for the work that they do. And it might be a complicated formula that includes uh, the depth of excavation. It might include how many days they're on the job site and everything else. But then on top of that, they're also going to start passing along the $29.9 per cubic meter for the indirect costs. Same idea with the steel assembly. Now, the, um, the surveying division is a little bit different because they just wanted to pass along as a percentage. And what we know about indirect costs is that it's a factor, F, and so 1 plus F times the amount of work that they're doing, $1.4 million worth of work, should equal to the $1.4 million plus the indirect that they have to recover. And I think I need to update that number as well to 554. But it's going to be approximately 40%, their indirect cost recovery.
Really? Okay. All right, yeah, I probably used the correct number in my calculator, but I wrote it down wrong. All right, so any questions about this uh, part one, indirect cost allocation? Okay, let's now talk about activity-based costing. Um, I already told you a little bit about the definition of a cost center. Uh, the cost center is a little bit of a misnomer because it's actually, it's the, uh, these are the organi organizations that generate the revenue. So not only do they generate the revenue, but when we're thinking about indirect costs, the, the people that are actually doing work are the ones that generate the indirect costs for the company's administrative support team. And so if there is a, a professor who's doing research, you know, the research money he's bringing in helps the university, or she, helps the university. Um, but then when the professor places an order for some equipment, that's generating an indirect cost in the main building. So there's a, um, a purchasing agent who now has to do, start doing research to find the best price, uh, has to spend time getting in touch with the supplier and so on. So cost centers <coughs> receive yeah, uh, the indirect costs so that the, uh, the true cost of their operations can be accounted for. Um, the activities are the support <coughs> groups that are helping out the cost center to do their main activity. So um, usually the company's purchasing department or quality control, IT supervision, these are not the organizations that get paid directly from the end customer. They have to be paid by someone, and so they get paid by the cost center that's requesting their services. And so from the perspective of indirect costs, it's confusing because remember, costs and revenues are the opposite. The cost centers generate revenue, but then they also generate the indirect costs. The activities are the, uh, the people that are supporting the cost centers and um, so the cost drivers are whatever activity they're engaging in that sort of pumps up the support resources that are needed. <clears throat> so in the case of the purchasing department, what makes the uh, purchasing department have indirect cost is the number of equipment orders that they have to fill. If there weren't any equipment orders being placed, then the purchasing department wouldn't have to exist. But if you have hundreds and hundreds of purchase orders per day that have to be processed, then that means that your purchasing department has to have a lot of employees. And so you have to look at what's the volume of some activity that's driving the indirect costs. For an IT department, it might be support tickets. For quality control, the people who are inspecting the finished item just to make sure that it doesn't have any flaws. Then it might be the volume of a project, how many items are being made is going to affect how many items they have to uh, inspect. So in part two of today's in-class exercise, we're going to be looking at the idea of activity-based costing. All right. So we're doing it uh, using the example of a university. Um, there are three majors within a certain college, and the three majors are engineering, safety technology, and computer science. <coughs> Now, yeah, yeah, the last part, I took it out. It was just getting to be, I thought, too many calculations and I didn't want to bore you all day long. So it's just A and B on your handout. I did part C, and that's when I realized this is too much. All right, all right so you can see that uh, there's differences in the number of faculty, students, how many computers they have, and how many support calls. It looks like the computer science guys are already good at computers, so they're not asking for very much support calls. Um, it seems like the safety technology has the fewest number of computers. So what we're doing in this is we're trying to figure out um, if you've got a certain amount of support budget, $145,000 per year, who's going to pay it? And Organizations are always arguing on what basis 
should budgets be recovered? And so this is going to look at, in part A, how much does each group have to kick in, like what's their share of the budget, if it's going to be based on support calls, and then in part B, what's their share of the budget if it should be based on the number of computers within each major. All right, so let's figure out what the share is and then take a look at the results. Okay, so if we do it on the basis of support calls per week, we know there's 13 calls per week, and uh, who's generating them? And then compare that to the number of computers. Which method will the computer science department want to go with? Why is the computer science department going to want to have the costs allocated on the basis of uh, support calls per week? Yeah, because their, their share of the budget will be much lower. Uh, look at the difference in range that safety has to pay. If they have to pay on the basis of how many phone calls they're making to the IT department, then they should pay 66000 per year to cover their share of the support calls. But if it's on the basis of the number of computers that they have, it should only be 29000 So that's a huge range. What's the right approach? Which, is, which one should they pay? What do you think? Okay, so maybe a weighted average? A portion of one method and a portion of the other? I mean, what led you to that idea? Why did you say we should do that approach? Okay. So what you're, what you're recognizing is it's not just the support calls that actually generates the costs. Yeah, the computers themselves do need some support. So what you'd need to do is you'd need to analyze how is the IT department spending their time. Like if you look at a one-year cycle, usually in the university environment, the IT department will uh, do something called, um, they'll image the computers twice a year. And imaging the computer means that they're completely wiping the hard drive clean and they're putting on new version of the software. Um, maybe they're updating the operating system. But it's a lengthy process. They usually do it between semesters. And so you're right. Some of the IT department's time is just maintaining the computers. It might be where they are um, you know, upgrading, upgrading the RAM or putting in new cables. But then during the academic year, a lot of their time is spent on support calls. But then even during the academic year, it's not all that. Sometimes the IT department is just doing things like uh, they're reading blogs about computers so that they can keep their technical knowledge up. They have to keep doing some continuing education. And so how you'd allocate the cost should be based on what actually the support organization is doing. And that's the key message I hope that you'll take away from this activity is that you can make an argument using any kind of criteria, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it represents the true costs. And so as much as possible, you should try and make your formula mirror the true costs that are being um, covered. All right. On Thursday, it's important that you're here. We're not only just going to talk about ethics, but there are some other things we're going to cover as well. So I'd encourage you, don't begin your break early and don't sleep in. I'm preaching to the choir. You guys are here, right? It's the people that aren't here that need to hear this message. Come to class on Thursday. All right, what's that? They'll see the video? Well, I'll have to put all the really good stuff and maybe edit that out of the video so that you can be amazed and the people who sleep in don't get the, uh, the amazing benefit. All right, so on your way out, just give me the front page. You can keep the ABC calculations with you. Have a great day, and I'll see you on Thursday.